Professor Matthew Bales. Matthew is a distinguished professor of astrophysics at Swinburne University. Matthew is the founder of the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing. He is one of the world's experts on neutron stars and was pivotal in the discovery of a new class of bursts of radiation from space called FAT, no, Fast Radio Bursts. I got it wrong in here, sorry about that. Fast Radio Bursts, not that fast. He is the director of a new centre of excellence in gravitational wave research called OSREV, which is one of the main sponsors for this event. His talk tonight is called Discovery of Gravitational Waves and the New Era of Astronomy. And the best part is he's going to do some virtual reality stuff that you will be able to have a play with at the end of the evening. Over to Matthew. Thanks very much. Oh, a chance to be a rock star instead of a scientist. <laughs> um, so, I'm actually the director of something called OSGRAV, which is the ARC Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. And the aim of that centre is to discover gravitational waves and study gravity, uh, which is an unusual uh, form of earning a living. But 102 years ago, Einstein predicted that there should be these mysterious waves travelling through the universe called gravitational waves. And unlike most things that Einstein put his mind to, he predicted that they'd never be detected because they were far too weak. But that was before the invention of the laser and quantum mechanics. So in 1915, Einstein showed that any time you have two gravitationally bound objects orbiting each other, they should give off gravitational waves. And he calculated, as Einstein was very good, at the amplitude of these gravitational waves. And if two black holes a billion light years away coalesced in a burst of gravitational wave radiation, the Earth would shake. And if you had a, a laser beam sh shining down a four kilometre vacuum tube and bouncing back, these waves, when they come through, would change the length of that arm by one ten thousandth of the width of a proton. <laughs> which is very, very small. <laughs> and, and yet, there's $30 million coming to us to, to study. <laughs> so, he thought, that's ridiculous, you're never going to achieve that. And if you look at the Earth going around the Sun, it radiates something like 200 watts, so a couple of light bulbs worth of gravitational wave energy. Unfortunately, you'd have to build a detector a, a light year long to be able to detect it, so that's no good. So our, our logo up there, which um, is Osgrad, is actually what a gravitational wave burst of radiation would look like if it um, was caused by two black holes kind of annihilating themselves. So I'm going to give you a little virtual tour of the universe here. And Mr. Zulu over here, otherwise known as Mark, is going to be our pilot. So a big hand for Mark here. And Mark wrote all the software, so if it doesn't work, it's his fault. <laughs> so, next slide. So, bring up the Earth, Mr. Zulu. I lost the Earth, yes. Okay. So this is the Earth, and not many people know that the metre is actually defined. So there's 40 million metres from the North Pole down to the South Pole and back again. So it's good old French. Um, not only did they elect Macron instead of Le Pen, they also define the metre. So there's 40 million metres around the world. It's far enough so that it takes you in an aeroplane a day or so to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. If you're a beam of light, you can travel around the world seven and a half times in one second. And I'm going to start talking about how big things are in terms of light seconds. So a beam of light, if you have enough mirrors set up properly, we go around the world seven and a half times a second. Now the Earth isn't actually a big by astronomical standards. So can you show us Jupiter, please, in relation to the Earth? <laughs> Warp speed, Mr. Zulu. Um, right, there we go. So you can see the Earth is pretty scrawny compared to Jupiter. Jupiter is made up mainly of hydrogen and helium. And it's heavy enough that it can retain the hydrogen and helium. The Earth struggles to retain helium, it just sort of floats away. But Jupiter's gravity is big enough to retain it. But Jupiter's actually pretty scrawny compared to the Sun. 
So if we can zoom out now, you can see we've almost lost sight of the Earth. And in fact, you could fit a million Earths inside the Sun. It's an incredible waste of solar energy. Um, only about one part in a hundred thousand million of the energy coming off the sun actually intercepts the earth and all the rest is wasted. A tragedy for environmental science, but nevertheless. Um, I'm not actually interested in the sun because the sun is actually a very boring star to study. Um, can you take me to a blue supergiant, please? <laughs> This is not a mistake. Do not adjust your sets. <laughs> Alright, keep going out please, Mr. Zulu. Right, so you can see we've almost lost track of the Earth. It's like a pixel. This is a HD monitor. Uh, and even Jupiter's looking pretty tiny. And there's the Sun. And the good thing about these big stars is that they live fast and die young. So, unlike our star, which takes about 10 billion years to burn all the hydrogen in its core, a star like that, which is a, a sort of blue supergiant, it gets through it all in about 10 million years. And that's quite a short amount of time in the age of the universe, which is about 10 billion or 14 billion years. And when these stars blow up at the end of their life, as Stefan explained, they actually leave behind a kind of a shiny little interior, which is made entirely of neutrons, or if they're big enough, they make a black hole. So I'll go to the next scene. Um, I actually spend a lot of my time at this place. It's not a paddock. Um, that tower is actually connected up to a 64 metre dish called the Park Dish. It used to feature on the $50 note, but it got bumped off by some PC types who no longer wanted science instruments on their notes. But anyway, this telescope is one of the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere, and it collects radio waves and it bounces them into that little cage at the top there, which we call the focus. And at that focus, there's something cooled to minus 250 degrees Celsius. And when the radio waves bounce in there, um, it actually rattles around the electrons. We amplify that by factors of over a million. And that voltage is then sampled one billion times by our supercomputer. And we study the stars using it. So we go to the next slide. So, this is actually something called the Crab Nebula. In 1054 AD, a bunch of monks were wandering around and they looked up and they noticed that there was a new star in the heavens. And it was actually this star. It had blown up and left behind a neutron star in its core. And the neutron star is currently spinning at 33 times a second. So it's 20 kilometers across, so um, about from here to, to say Essendon, and it rotates 33 times a second. When it was first born, it was actually spinning at about 16 times, uh, sorry, about 50 times a second. And all that energy is lighting up what used to be the star. So that filamentary stuff you can see out there looks quite pretty. It's actually what's called the Crab Nebula. And according to some astronomers, that looks like a crab. I can't see it myself. But uh, why don't you take us in, Mr. Zulu, and we'll have a look at the neutron star in the side there. Okay, so this is what's called a pulsar. Pulsars have a magnetic field which is about 100 million times stronger than your average bridge magnet. And you may not realise it, but when you spin a magnet, it doesn't like it and it howls in pro protest. And it actually gives off light. And it has this um, big magnetic field which collimates the electrons as they're ripped off the surface. The voltage above the polar cap is 10 to the 15 volts. That's one of 15 zeros. Don't so stick your finger in the socket. <laughs> Luckily for us, this thing's about 6,000 light years away, and by the time the pulses hit our radio telescope, we just get a little pulse. And there was a lady called Jocelyn Bell back in 1967 who grabbed the, one of the best radio telescopes of the day, plugged it in, and she noticed that on her chart record of power, there were these regular pulses coming about once a second from a neutron star, which it's a little bit like this one, rotates about once every second, and she got a beam of, of light. So we can actually use these flashes of light. If you want to change the orientation mark, I don't want to squirt at the audience too much. Um, if we were looking from this angle, we wouldn't see this pulsar at all, because all the radio waves would just travel past us. It actually has to, the beam has to point at you. 
So you have to be quite lucky. And there's about two and a half thousand of these little guys that have been discovered um, in our galaxy. And the team here finds them for a living. So when you first find them, it's quite exciting. And you work out how fast they're rotating. And the fastest one we've ever found rotates 700 times a second. So 20 kilometers across, 700 times a second. So I can't even make a noise that would be appropriate for that. Um, but it's somewhere in the audio range. And so these neutron stars hadn't been um, discovered when Einstein created his, his theory of relativity. And if you actually calculate how many gravitational waves two neutron stars would give off if you could smash them together, then you might have a chance of actually detecting it. So luckily for us, um, maybe 10 or 15 years after Einstein had passed away, the neutron star was discovered. There's now about two and a half thousand. If I can go to the next slide. And luckily, some of them travel around other stars. And the orbital periods, that's how long it takes to go around once, is, is not quite as fast, I must confess. The shortest one we know of is about 90 minutes. So two stars going around each other every 90 minutes. So a year in that system is, is like 90 minutes. That's what we call very relativistic. The velocity of the stars is up to about 500 kilometers every second, whereas our Earth going around the Sun is about 30 kilometers per second. And this is what's called a binary pulsar. And because it's traveling to and from, or getting closer and further away from us, when the pulses hit our telescope, they're actually delayed. And we can map the orbit by listening to the pulses. And that's what I do for a living. And in fact, people like Renee over there has just discovered a planet going around a pulsar. And she did that by timing when the pulses hit our telescope. So if we go to the next slide, Fortunately, back in 1974, a student, PhD student, a little bit like these people here, um, discovered the first ever binary pulsar, and it was one neutron star going around another. And they went around each other every eight hours, and the neutron star was rotating every 59 milliseconds, so about 16 times a second it was spinning around. And they realized that if Einstein was right, this orbit should shrink by three millimeters every orbit because the gravitational waves would take away energy and the two neutron stars would get closer together. And so they just thought, well, we'll just go and measure that. And it was about 25,000 light years to this particular system. But what happened was the neutron star, because the orbit's shrinking, it actually got back to the sort of start line a little bit earlier, every orbit. And because it did three orbits a day, they waited 10 years. That time, that distance that they um, were getting back to the start line got bigger and bigger in a quadratic way. And they measured it, and in 1993 they got given the Nobel Prize for Physics for verifying that Einstein's prediction that these orbits should shrink was correct. So a trip to Stockholm later, lots of champagne, what was what left was to do. And they realized that in, a hundred, in about 300 million years, these two neutron stars were going to get so close they'd rip each other apart. So the National Science Foundation and the Australian Research Council and various other people said, let's build a detector and let's measure neutron stars annihilating each other. So I'll go to the next slide. Luckily for us, the, after the Big Bang, this was the temperature of the sky. And this is actually a map that astronomers have made of what, how hot the sky was about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. It's very uniform, except it varies by about one part in 100,000. And that's enough to see galaxies um, formation. So when the universe was expanding, it was a little bit over dense in some areas and under dense in others. Let's build a universe mark. Yep. Okay, so this is a, a, a universe being formed. You just saw 14 billion years go past. It didn't look like it. <laughs> but each one of those dots represents hundreds of galaxies. And this is what the sort of large scale structure of the universe is like. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So this is how you make an individual galaxy on a supercomputer. If you're somebody like Alan, who's your next speaker, you basically do a whole lot of sums very, very often. You calculate the gravity between every particle and every other particle. When the density gets above a certain magic number, bam, you make a star, which is the white stuff, and you end up building a galaxy. We're in a galaxy like this one that has about 100 billion stars. And luckily for us, about every 100 years, one blows up. About every 1,000 years, you make a pulsar. About every 100,000 years, two pulsars annihilate each other because they're giving off gravitational waves. So let's go to the next slide. 
If you look up at the sky, you'll see that it's made of all these different sorts of galaxies. <laughs> and what we did is we counted how many galaxies there are in the universe. We knew how often two neutron stars should coalesce in each one. And then we worked out how big a detector we'd have to build in order to see a neutron star coalesce about once a year. And we said, it looks as though it's going to cost about 900 billion. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> the National Science Foundation said, that's awesome, because we love science. And we love doing fundamental science. And if we could detect gravitational <coughs> waves, we'd be able to study gravity in ways that people, are, people like Einstein have only ever dreamed of. So we worked out we'd need to have something like 100,000 galaxies within our range. That meant building a um, detector, which was four kilometers in length, shine a 20 watt laser on the mirror, let the light bounce in to and fro. The gravitational wave comes through, the arms of the detector do this. <laughs> magnified by a very, very large factor, and then using some magic with quantum mechanics and mirrors, we should be able to see the Osgrove logo. Um, so if I could uh, go to the next slide. So if we go back to our universe, so that was 14 billion years. Uh, I took out the expansion of the universe because otherwise it looks a bit confusing. So the range of the old gravitational wave detectors that our forefathers had built was the size of a little blue dot here, Mark. Okay, you saw the little blue dot. It's right in the middle. That's 20 megaparsecs, or 60 million light years. And unfortunately, if that's all there in the distance, you can see the chance of seeing a gravity wave go through your detector is pretty tiny. So they built something called Advanced LIGO, which is kind of like son of LIGO. Can we show you in the next? Um... So that was how far LIGO should see after the, the upgrade. It was about a factor of four further. And now you're talking about one gravitational wave per year should be able to be detected. Part of Osgrove's mission is to make LIGO even better. And when we've finished it, it should be able to detect gravitational waves out to this distance. And now we're starting to get some serious galaxies, people. And we should see lots of gravitational waves. And after designing all of this stuff to look for neutron stars, we didn't actually discover them. But we did discover two black holes. And because black holes are big and black and dark, you cannot study them. They just sit there doing nothing until they annihilate each other, and then they give off a burst of gravitational waves. And so the range of the detector for gravitational waves is actually gigantic, it's that far. So any pair of black holes, anywhere in there, we've got their number, we're going to see it. They're going to coalesce, gravitational waves are going to come through, mirrors move by one ten-thousandth of a proton about 400 times a second. Magic, we can see that. So let's go to a pair of black holes and like, try and understand how this works. So you can see the black holes are there, they're going around each other. They're pretty damn black, Mark, I'm not sure we can see them. Let me just come to where the poor audience is and try and understand this. There's two black holes, who can see the black holes? Yeah. Okay. At this point, their separation is 50,000 kilometers. And we're going to see the last 50 milliseconds of these little guys. Okay, go! Boom! So they form at the end a single black hole, which is just rotating very, very fast. And you can see that that's the amplitude of the gravitational wave going up, 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 um, just behind them. And this is what happened on the 5th. No, 14th of September, 2000, 2015, two gravitational wave detectors in America, both vibrated. Go to the next line. And this is what we saw. This is real data, we're not even faking it for a change. <laughs> you can see the trace at Hanford, and you can see the trace at Livingston. And this is real time. And this is what happened, this is how the mirrors moved. Both about 3,000 kilometers apart, seven milliseconds later, one started vibrating after the other. And if we go to the next uh, slide, this is the real data. So this is the Hanford detector up top there, the Livingston detector in the middle, and you can overlay them and show that they're amazingly what we call correlated. When one goes up, the other goes up. They're both oriented the same way in, in space, so when the gravitational wave goes through, it's just a matter of where, where in the sky it was coming from that helps you to um, discover it. And this is a grand total of about 0.2 seconds. And so the black holes went through, supercomputers, there were something like 20,000 processors crunching away, and they got it, which was one of the great achievements in science. They're going to win the Nobel Prize later this year, there's no doubt. And can we go to the final slide? 
And this is our mission. The Australian government was good enough to give us some money to, to help on this um, task of discovering gravitational waves, learning about black holes. Is Einstein's general theory of relativity correct? The prediction is down there in the logo, and what we saw was almost exactly the same as that. And um, I think it's amazing that we can do this sort of stuff, and uh, thank you for taxpayers. <laughs> no, 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 are there any more predictions that Einstein have made that we still haven't proven? Like, we've spent the last hundred years proving general theory of, of relativity and all its predictions. Is there anything left? Yeah, so there's some aspects of the general theory of relativity that we, we haven't tested very well. So one is that the black hole should be spinning, and the spin should actually change that wave from a little bit. Is anybody wearing an Osgrove t-shirt here? Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. see. I can see the. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, that pattern yeah. should change slightly if the black hole spins are kind of anti-parallel or parallel or to the side. Um, so learning about how a black hole spin is something we're going to do. If one goes off really, really close, we'll get what's called very good signal to noise. So that little wiggles down the bottom. They're not really gravitational waves. It's just the detector. You know, a few atoms hitting the mirror and you're making a move and stuff. Um, so there's another thing called the no hair theorem. That is that black holes can be characterized by just their mass, charge, and spin. Um, so it's a really fantastic laboratory to be able to smash black holes together and, and study them rather than just do everything on paper. But unfortunately, I've spent my life doing tests of general relativity and it keeps working. And I'll be really famous if I can find an example where it doesn't work. Yeah, so, so, so today it's been very good. As a, as a follow-up, um, as a follow-up, which not really, is gravity a wave or a particle? Oh. So there's a very big difference between a gravitational wave and gravity. So gravity, you can think of the curvature of space-time due to mass, and that curvature tells particles how to move. But we don't think of gravity as waves, but we do think that maybe the force of gravity is carried by something called the graviton. And studying these black holes enables us, enables us to put a limit on the, the mass of the graviton. Okay. Thank you. Hello? How do you know that that signal um, that you just brought up to your claim um, is a black hole and not a pulsar? The question is, how do we know it's a black hole and not a pulsar? That's a very good question. And in fact, when I first got into this, I wondered that myself. So it turns out that the frequency of that wave um, can be redshifted by the expansion of the universe. And if it was um, two neutron stars, we can work out the frequency of that wave and it'll be much higher frequency. But also the amplitude of that wave tells us how far away it is. So if you put it twice as far away, the amplitude goes down by a factor of two. And unfortunately it starts to descend into the noise and get harder to see. Uh, like the, um, how is Osprey going to be spending the $30 million that it's been allocated to it? We're building another detector. So the question is how is Osprey going to spend its money? It's mainly on PhD students and postdocs who have done a PhD and want to become scientists like me <laughs> and are uh, doing the next stage of their sort of education slash work. So probably most of the money goes into training students and, and training postdocs. And then we're building laser beams and stuff to try and make the detector better. So we So luckily uh, Australia wasn't asked to contribute to the capital cost of the, the telescope, but we do send our engineers and scientists over there to help tune it. And also to the people in Western Australia, for instance, helped make the detectors vibrate less. The people at ANU, um, helped the laser beams acquire what we call locks so you could actually start. The, the, the light comes in, it goes two ways, and when it comes back together, it's not easy to catch it and get it in phase, and they, they helped with that. Um, people at Monash have helped 
to uh, make rotational waves to, to calibrate the instrument. And at Adelaide University, they built these special cameras to help stabilize the mirror. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Nisha, could you repeat it back to you? Oh, we'll repeat it. I've heard it. <laughs> um, what happens after two black holes collide, that mass, so that body, does it expand or does it sort of stay as a stable state? Very good question. So it turns out the radius of a black hole is proportional to the mass. So you make it twice as heavy, it gets twice as big. But that's eight times the volume, so in some ways it gets less dense. Um, the other thing that's really exciting is that the gravitational waves carry away energy. And during that 0.2 millisecond, or 0.2 seconds, those black holes gave off more energy than the rest of the universe put together. So there was more energy coming off from those two black holes than every star and every galaxy shining. So it's about three solar masses times C squared of energy was given off in 0.2 of a second. Current is pretty awesome. <laughs> squared. Yeah, so the speed of light squared is 9 by 10 to the 16. So every kilogram gives you 9 by 10 to the 16 joules. You could power Australia by just you know, one kilogram of that sort of stuff. But this was 60 solar masses, which is 60 times 2 by 10 to the 30 <laughs> kilograms in Ten, two tenths of a second. <laughs> Luckily, it was long way away. <laughs> but, and that's happening once a year, just in the space that LIGO can. So the question was, is that happening once a year? Just in the space that LIGO. It's can actually happening more than yeah. once a year, and there was another paper put out um, last year, describing the second uh, event, and then the detector's been running since sort of Christmas time and the hope is that we'll soon publish more. So other than the detectors, will anyone or anything else know? Will we shake and shudder or certain Yeah, everybody on the Earth gets squeezed a little bit one way than the other. Um, but the, the amount is, is kind of tiny. Um, so you probably don't notice it. If you're about a thousand kilometers from the black holes, you get squashed about five centimeters. The, the fractional change is the equivalence of the width of a human hair um, at the distance of Alpha Centauri, which is four light years away. So that's the, the, the size of the contraction. It's kind of small. All set, all done? And if you want to experience some of these things in VR later, um, Captain Zulu, who did all the work for this talk, so a big hand to Mark, please. Video that's come from CSIRO tonight, we couldn't quite make the technology work at the start.